Well, let me just start with some housekeeping that uh, I will repeat perhaps once. Um, first, thanks a lot, uh, Molly and Robin, for, for joining us and contributing to the uh, webinar series. Uh, great to have you. Uh, this is going to be cool for all of you who haven't heard about the mouse phenome database. It's way more than a database at this point. It's actually an analytic platform. Um, and just the housekeeping part is we will be recording. If you want to come back to this recording at any point, that will be possible. Just remember our link, opar.io, as I recall. Let me double check that I've got it. Um, chat. Just, uh, but let me put it in the chat for everybody. Opar.io should get you there. Uh, you'll have to noodle around and just look at the pull down menus, but you'll find the seminar webinar series there. Um, the, we have an hour presentation roughly from Molly and Robin and team. And then we have an open mic session uh, not just question and answers, although those are more than welcome, but more extended discussions on where we're going as a field in substance use disorder, genetics, phenomics, and whatever, whatever frankly interests you as a, as a listener. Um, so feel free to engage. Uh, I, several of you I see in the uh, participant list already are, uh, let, let's put it, uh, this way, highly verbal. So please, uh, please be highly verbal. Uh, during the actual presentation, if you if you want to interrupt, um, you can do it best probably by just typing in a uh, message into the chat, and David and I or Spencer will will review those uh, quickly. If we think we can answer them, we will do so. If we don't, we'll pass them up to, to Molly and Robin to field the questions if it's really critical to understand right away. If it's something that can be deferred to the open mic session, we will just, just note that in our answers to you. And um, with that, uh, did Alyssa show up? Let's see. Yes, Alyssa. yes I did. I was, I was actually just... Uh... Um, letting people know that I was here. Okay, terrific. So um, Alyssa, I was will, needed. Yeah. Uh, I, I threatened to do an embarrassing introduction, and uh, you've rescued Molly and Robin from from that fate. So I'm please. sure they appreciate it. Well, well, thanks, <laughs> thanks for having us um, I, I, once again to to um, the seminar series. Um, what we wanted to talk about today is um, some of the um, new and exciting uh, features in the mouse phenome database and also for people who are unfamiliar with it, uh, uh, what we do, uh, what's been uh, the bread and butter of mouse phenome database since uh, well before I became involved with it, which is uh, really good curation of individual mouse phenotype data across many different areas of disease relevant research. So um, how, we, how we document, uh, annotate, and uh, present phenotypic data from studies much like the ones that many of us are involved in uh, and pass that to uh, an increasing uh, set of, of informatics tools. We've also recently done a lot to expand access to the phenome database, um, including uh, enhancement of machine access, and we have a fair trust uh, compliance uh, um, project ongoing uh, that, that we um, can also elaborate on. So um, there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot that's that's changed for people who have used uh, the Phenome database um, in 1999. Uh, welcome back. And uh, um, I, I can't wait to see uh, what Molly and, and Robin and others have to present. Okay. Thanks much, Molly. Yeah, take it away. Um, okay. You introduce yourself a little more, a uh, bit more granularly, uh, or the start, please do. Okay. Um, yes, th thank you very much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Uh, I wanted to introduce the, the senior MPD team. Besides me, it's Robin, who's a computational scientist, Vivek Phillip, who's our lead biostatistician, 
Dave Walton, who is our lead software engineer, Melissa Chesler, who is our co-investigator, as well as our faculty advisor. Oh no, my slides are not advancing. Just click on your presentation. Yeah. There we go. There you go. <clears throat> okay. Now, how do I get back? What's going on? I think you just have a lag. There you go. Okay. So NIH is an NIH, uh, MVD is an NIH recognized data repository. We want to get that out there. Um, and as Rob said, we, we become much more than just a repository, but we are NIH recognized. And this is a screenshot of our homepage. Purpose and goals uh, are to provide validated protocols and relevant data collected under those protocols, and also to provide statistical tools um, that enable a variety of different research applications, including choosing optimal strains, <clears throat> elucidating shared genetics for correlated traits, discovering genotype-phenotype relationships, formulating hypotheses and testing in silico, studying sex differences and sex by genotype interactions, and assessing replicability. The current contents, we have phenotype data, of course. Uh, we have over 6,500 strains. Hundreds of those are inbred strains. We have collaborative cross, diversity outbred, BXD and other RI lines, the hybrid mouse diversity panel, chromosome substitution strains, F1 hybrids, transgenics, and targeted mutants. There are thousands of measures, and these measures are annotated to relevant ontologies, among other important information. And th these are stored at the individual mouse level. We also have genotype data. Um, we have a new resource, which we'll be telling you about. It's on over 580 strains at 83 plus million genome wide locations. And what we've done is combined numerous data sets, including the B6Eve, Sanger, Perligen, Center for Genome Dynamics, 69 collaborative cross strains, and the UCLA data set, among others. And what we've done is imputed <clears throat> SNPs, and we are calling this resource the Genome Muster. And again, I'll tell you more about that later. MPD is a widely utilized resource. Um, and what I'm showing here are a number of publications over the years. These are manually found by Google Scholar. So this is definitely an underrepresentation of the the actual publications, but you can see that we've had success in people using the resource as uh, part of their research. And what are people using it for? Um, to access, access baseline and treatment data. For example, this plot that I'm showing here, um, if you wanted to do a QTL traditional study, you would choose extreme strains. <clears throat> one from the high end and one from the low end, for example, or if you were studying a drug to lower cholesterol, you'd want to choose a strain that has high cholesterol and not low cholesterol already. So choosing mouse strains for these various applications here, I'll just let you scan through those, accessing protocols and also accessing genotype data. It's also used to benchmark protocols in users on laboratories, to aggregate and analyze phenotype data, compare genetics results across populations, identify sensitized strain backgrounds for making new mouse models with genome editing technologies, identify interesting strains based on multidimensional phenotypic profiles, assess replicability and reproducibility across experimental conditions and protocols, 
and perform GWAS meta-analysis. Our current statistical tool, tool set encapsulates these frequently used queries. And here are some of our tools with little icons. And what, what I'll do is go through a few of these today, not all of them. I just want to mention that MPD follows the RIVE guidelines. I'm sure everyone's familiar with those. Um, so not only do we collect the data very carefully, we annotate that data very carefully. And we try our best to uh, fulfill each of these check marks um, for ARRIVE guidelines. I also want to mention that we have an NIDA supplement to make MPD more FAIR compliant. FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And here are some of the things that we're doing, uh, expanding to additional ontologies, enhancing the API, employing metadata standards, and add licenses per data set. For trustworthiness, um, we are doing a couple of things. We're adopting metadata standards and refining the user experience and self-curation. And in addition, we're working on metrics so that we can have traceability methods for data usage because they're needed for reproducibility. Before we go to the tools, I wanted to mention the study intake platform, which is an application that we've built um, to allow any investigator or data contributor to contribute their data to MPD. So not only can you upload the data, you can annotate your own data. So for example, this particular page is project details. We have a page for animal profile, procedures, data upload, et cetera. And I'm just gonna go through the first four, show you screenshots of those. So this is project information. I skipped a page. Animal housing conditions. And this is a lot on a single slide, but you can just eyeball it to see the kind of information that we're trying to collect, which is quite a lot. Procedures. There are five accordions. And if you click on any of these accordions, you get to uh, forms to fill in. For example, equipment is a table that you fill out listing all the equipment that was used. Same thing with reagents and solutions. Environmental conditions are things like the, the light intensity in a room or the dimensions of a testing room, things like that. The actual steps are here. And that, again, you enter those kind of in a tabular way, step by step. We have room for additional arrived guidelines if they haven't been covered in these previous sections. So for example, randomization, how was that? How was the study randomized would go in this section here. <clears throat> you upload the data and you specify whether it's individual animals or strain means. And automatically a data dictionary is, is produced which has your column IDs uh, to the left here. And it guesses what the data type is based on the data. And it guesses the variable type. But uh, a data contributor is free to go in and change any of this, uh, make adjustments. Then you enter metadata for or for a measure. And this is for a single measure. It's not for the whole project. It's just for a single measure. And you can see again, how many different fields that we have that we are trying to collect the data for, our, for including ontology mappings. It's very important for search and aggregation of data. So you can search, find, analyze data in multiple ways, uh, including all these that I've listed here. In addition to the ontology term, <clears throat> there's also treatment. And I'm just going to go through some use cases based on treatment. 
And we'll just go through these one by one. <clears throat> Strain effects of cocaine induced locomotor activity. So you could go to the search bar and type in cocaine and come up with a table of measures that we have available. Um, you can see that the data set is shown, the procedure is shown, treatment if there is one, the phenotype measure variable, including the units and the measurement number, the panel, number of strains, sex, age, sample size, year. So all those things are available and you can sort on any of these columns or search on any of these columns. And I'm going to do a search on Tarantino because I know that she has done uh, a cocaine study. What I wanna mention is these check boxes, they're used for selecting data to use the analysis tools or to add them to your collection. And we'll be doing some of this during this, during this talk. So I wanna make sure everyone understands how to do it. Anytime you see a checkbox, you can check, check it and click add to folder. Then at the top of any MPD page, we've got my MPD, you would click on that and then click on my collection and you would get my collection. And you can see at the bottom, we've added Tarantino's uh, measure. Let's look at some data. Let's look at treated day three for distance travel with cocaine. And this is the plot. It's a typical strain survey plot. Uh, you can see there's continuous data over a di very diverse set of strains. Below each plot are, again, accordions, which you can open each one to see measure summary, ANOVA, QQ plot, strain means that can be adjusted or unadjusted, individual animal values, and where possible, you can do GWAS um, using linear mixed models. And I'm just going to show you the ANOVA for now uh, and the QQ plot. And you can see through the QQ plot, theoretical versus observed values that it's, it's fairly normally distributed. And the ANOVA is above that, the results for the ANOVA. So you can see strain has an effect. <clears throat> for the next couple of examples, I'm gonna use data from the Center for Neurogenetics of, of Addiction. <clears throat> Melissa is the PI of that um, center. If we take, for example, repeated measures, this is distance travel, last 60 minutes, post-injection on successive days. So day one and day two are saline only. Days three through 11 are cocaine. Saline again on 12 and cocaine again on 19. And you can see really nice strain differences based on these different curves. But you can also do uh, some various things with the options. We could look at Z scores and bars. And this is the same data in Z score and bars. And you can see it's even more pronounced where we have cast. Mm -hmm. BWK and WSB, you're really showing quite different results from the classical inbred strains. Bivariate phenotypic correlations. Okay, what I've done here is chosen various um, measures from CSNAO3. I've got two open field test measures. I've got two intravenous self administration uh, measures and two reversal learning measures um, to look at. And we're gonna look at the scatter plot correlations. And this is what that looks like. It's the matrix uh, where you have thumbnail scatter plots below the diagonal and above the diagonal you have uh, kind of color coded and visually 
improved ways of assessing the data. The red is negative correlations, the blue is positive correlations, and the more intense the color, the more, the, more, uh, the higher the absolute value of the correlation. And the larger the circle, the lower the p-value. So it's very easy to, to assess very quickly. But you can go ahead and click on any of these cells to get to further information and, and additional plots. I could ask to see all of these data points labeled, which gets pretty crowded in this case, or I can hover over a data point to see what it is, what strain it is, and I can see what the values are for each of the measures. We can identify interesting strains based on multidimensional phenotypic profiles. Again, I've got the same measures. I'm going to choose multivariate outlier detection. And this is what that looks like. Um, we've got a, a plot with both, one with male only, one with female only. And you can see the strain names sometimes get bunched up, but you can adjust the width of the, the uh, plots in the, in the plot options. But you can also select the strains that you're interested in. And I should say, below the, below the line are the outliers. Below the red line are the outliers. And if I click on that, below that then comes up a table showing the scale least square strain means for each of these with the <clears throat> measures at the top of the table and the strains along the side. And you can see very quickly which strains are outliers for particular measures. And you can also see the phenotypic profiles for each strain. And you can, I think, quickly eyeball this and see that really there's no two strains that are alike. They're, they're quite different. So this would be a handy tool for identifying outliers for whatever research application you may have. Assess replicability and reproducibility across experimental conditions and protocols. For this, um, I've chosen distance traveled. So what we need to do is, is choose a phenotype where we have multiple measures in NPD and compare that to our own data. So data that's not in the database, it's done by an investigator. Hope that, hope that made sense. Um, so what I've done is chosen distance traveled for four different projects, Bolivar, CSNA03, Kumar2, Pletcher1. So these are coming from different laboratories. And what I want to do is compare my data to these data that are in the database. And one handy tool that we've come up with is to compare measured metadata. This pulls up a table with the measurements at the top and the, in this case, the project attributes along the side. And you, so you can compare side by side uh, the different measures to make sure that you're choosing the best ones. We also have this for animal documentation and environmental conditions and measure metadata. So we're going to go with these four. And then we choose the G GXL replicability analysis button. And we come to a page where I can enter the parameter name. I can upload a CSV file of individual animals, or I can fill in group summaries. And that's what I'm going to do. So I filled those in. I've got five groups. I can adjust the analysis options and run the analysis. And we get a plot like this, which is confidence intervals of mean differences. So it's kind of a pairwise comparison. Um, the differences of group means are on the x-axis, the y-axis is measured value, and the strains are actually listed at 
at the point of zero, just for convenience. Um, and non-significant are in the dark blue, significant is orange, and the outer segments are the GXL adjusted data, and the inner segments, like here, the inner segment here is um, the non-adjusted. So you can see there's quite a bit of difference. A table also comes with this, giving you all the numbers that are involved. And you can see very quickly, just looking at the unadjusted p-values, they're all significant except one. But if you look at the GXL adjusted, they're all insignificant except one. So this would help reduce uh, false positives um, and help you determine if your study is replicable or not. This is, this is Alyssa. I, I thought maybe I'd interject a little bit about this. This, this tool was developed originally by Yoav Benjamini and the idea was to take data from a single experiment and compare it to other studies that are uh, using the same measurement to ask the question of how likely it is that the finding from one experiment done in one lab uh, would replicate. And so the, the um, GXL adjustment is a way of using archival data from the phenome database to estimate what the laboratory by or genotype by laboratory environment differences are scale the difference between strains based on that. And so you might say, all of these are statistically significant strain differences, but if I was going to grab one of these and try to um, do additional studies or say, this is a great strain comparison to take into your lab to, to, to compare the ones that we're most confident in based on the pr projected stability across laboratories are the ones that survive the GXL adjustment. He's written several nice papers about this random laboratory model and the adjustment uh, that, that uh, we've now built into MPD. Thank you, especially thank you for mentioning Yoav. Okay, um, performing GWAS meta-analysis to discover genotype phenotype relationships. Um, so we're going to look at meta-analysis meta and genome muster, and I thought I'd look at muster first. Um, what we've done is consolidated various data sets, um, which we ha already had and which we acquired recently. Uh, for example, B6E, which was, which was sequenced in 2019, has been added to our SNP set. Um, there's disparate densities of type SNPs. Most lack sequence data. 90% of the strains are missing greater than 90% of the SNPs. And then we basically harmonized all the strains in individuals. So we've got a comprehensive SNP resource. Before imputation, 90% of the strains are missing, greater than 90% of the calls, as you can see by this histogram. And after imputation, all the strains are greater than 95% complete, which is, which is good. Um, the imputation is highly accurate. The median accuracy is 0.944 in spite of these 14 out of the 581 that had accuracies of less than seven. And if you look closely at these, you'll, you'll see right away that these are wild derived strains uh, as opposed to the classical strains, which are falling in these bars. Here's an example of our search query form. You basically enter a gene, our QTL symbol, um, a ref seek ID, um, our coordinates, our coordinate range here. Any of those items will work. You can add flanks to the locations upstream and downstream. You can select strains of interest one by one. 
or you can select strain panels if that works for you. And then below here, there's a, a button for search. And this is the results table. You can see we've got chromosome location, RSID, the observed alleles, functional annotation, gene, and then the reference, which is B6 Eve, and the different strains. And this is scrollable up, up and across as well. The columns can be moved, so you can group things closer together if you want to. For example, I might want to move this one next to this, this one that has a T, and this one, which has a T next to this one. Uh, data can be downloaded under options, and the search can be directly edited by clicking here. We've also got a way to filter based on the imputation confidence uh, levels. So here I'm saying show the confidence level data. So it, it does color code it. And if I move this slider up, say in, in the middle, I would lose all those uh, data SNPs that, that don't meet that criteria. They wouldn't show up in the, in the table. <clears throat> okay, the meta analysis tool is for user selected set of measures. Um, what we've done, and I hope I've convinced you that we, we've done a lot of curation of the study data, including ontology terms, strains, panels, procedures, diets, treatments. What we can do is harmonize across all the studies, procedures, treatments, and populations, and pool the power across studies populations and measures. So in this example, um, we've got response to cocaine trait. And you can see some of those measures are showing up here, although there are quite a few more than that. You can name your measurement set. You can tag it so you can come back to it because the operation can take several minutes to do. So you may want to set a tag Um, once you have your measures that you're interested in, you just hit the meta analysis button and you get this result shown here. The Manhattan plot is the result that you get. Um, the SNP that's showing here is a minus log 10 p value of 47, so it's pretty high, very significant. If you click on that, you get a PM plot shown here and a forest plot shown here. The, the PM plot is the P value versus the M value, where greater than nine, the study has an effect. If it's less than one, it does not have an effect. And in between those two, uh, it, the effect is uncertain. So you can see that, for example, this, this highest one has a p-value, uh, a, a minus log 10 p-value of about 3.5. So it alone would not have shown up very, very readily on a Manhattan plot. But in combination with all these other measures, you can see how we get um, uh, a SNP that has a log, minus log 10 p-value of 47. And I just wanted to give one more shot to study intake platform um, and request for those people that are interested in contributing data to please contact us. Uh, we'll work with you to get the data in. You can contact us at phenomatjax.org. Uh, at the bottom of every page is a help or feedback button. You can use those at any time to get back to us or ask for help or just email us directly at phenomatjax.org. And here's the team. And they've done a terrific job. 
And I believe that's it for me. That's great. Thank you, Molly. Um, there's a lot of great questions in the chat, and uh, I'm assuming that, that the participants have questions as well. Um, so maybe. Let me just start by saying fabulous job, team. I mean, Molly, this is, this is, this is getting damn sophisticated, and it really is the analytics uh, that are now coming to the fore. So it's, it's quite, quite awesome. I have to say, I'm, I'm actually envious, <laughs> which is a good thing. Uh, but, but believe me, uh, the Gene Network team, I don't know how many of them are on, but I hope Arthur is on. Uh, they're they're going to be looking at this very carefully. And I guess uh, we should definitely circle around and see how we can harmonize the code and the APIs, which of course we've been talking about forever. Uh, but but this is definitely a motivation on our side to do it more seriously. So bravo. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rob. I'm, I'm, I think the team's really super happy to hear that. And in fact, uh, looking at the chat, there is definitely some questions about that. The Phenome Database API um, is, is being refined, um, but is usable to pull data. Uh, and, and so one thing that, that you can always continue to do, at least in terms of, of um, using the data that's been curated in, into MPD and pulling that into Gene Network for exposure to your tool set, uh, I would say work with the API. Um, you know, likewise, um, I think accessing some of these tools uh, we should we should figure out how to um, expose these tools to some of the other um, data sets that are out there, and that that does include the rat uh, data, which is in many cases very similarly structured and can easily be uh, used in the same tool set. So um, I do hope that we continue to have those active uh, dialogue about how to harmonize this suite of tools and make it straightforward for people in this research community to integrate their data uh, and ask more global questions um, using, using the tools that we have. Great. I'm, well, I'm skimming through the questions, but yeah. So one, one of the questions somebody asked and I, um, was, um, are our um, protocols in protocols.io and um, we, we had an active process to uh, do that at one point, and we're going to work with them to uh, reinvigorate that. Um, it's, it um, is something that, that uh, we understood required a license that, uh, subscription uh, that would not have been practical, but with publicly available data and protocols, that's not required. So we'll, we'll work with them more closely to make sure that each of these is in protocols.io with the DOI. We do have a way of entering the protocols.io into MPD's uh, protocols. Mm -hmm. So we can but pull them they're, in. They're embedded, oh, yeah. Yeah, so if you're already using it to document your procedures, that's a, one, one of the more straightforward things that you can enter. Yeah. Maybe another point to emphasize, the, the meta-analysis tool is quite cool. When, when you combine the capabilities of Muster, uh, the SNP grid to the meta-analysis tool, it means that we can look for a consensus across different mouse populations where the same variants may be supported in the DO, the VXD, the HMDP. Uh, we can simultaneously analyze those data. And using things like the PM plot, we can identify which of those variants are coming up because they're specific to one of the populations that's being used versus uh, something idiosyncratic about the measurement that's being used or anything like it. So you can use it for cross -po population work. You can use it for trait meta-analysis work. Um, you can use it to see if there are shared variants that underlie related phenotypes that may have pleiotropic effects. So there's a lot of applications of that tool. Um, so we're really excited to roll it out. It's one of the key things that we were, we had to build a lot of different tools, tools just to bring data into that meta-analysis framework. Um, there's a nice set of questions about SNP genotypes. 
and the imputation and, and muster. So maybe we can, can um, discuss some of those. Uh, let's see, so, so um, one, one of course is which, variant, uh, which version of the genome are we using and, and, and will we be updating? And the answer to that is yes. And, and the objective is to allow people to roll back um, in, in, in time. But as, as everyone knows, keeping up with updating and uh, maintaining mouse genomes has been a challenge. Um, can we filter for SNPs only in coding regions? Um, I, I assume we, we can. Uh, Robin, do you wanna talk about some of the uh, muster MVAR type interface uh, Im improvements that we're anticipating? Uh, sure, so um, one of the things that we're doing is we're collaborating with um, MVAR, working on um, other variation data, sort of annotation data. And so we're hoping to basically enhance muster with some of their annotation data. And in addition to that, just like a, an easy way to do it quickly, I'm not sure if you can search, you may be able to search or, or um, um, basically order the data based on that column that you're interested in, but you can also download the data and then just get those coding regions. So that could be like a quick, quick way of doing it. So you can filter what you, what you retrieve. Um, so MVAR, for those of you who aren't familiar with the effort, is um, a, an effort to harmonize the mouse variant registry. Um, it's being led by Carol Bolt at JAX, uh, uh, who's the PI of the Mouse Genome Informatics Group. Um, so that, that's also um, going to have a public facing interface. Yeah, so we're continuing to improve on it. It's, it's meant to be a dynamic resource. So we'll improve imputations or replace imputations with known data when we have it. We'll add new strains, we'll add SNPs as data come in. Um, we'll redo imputations, you know, especially if we get um, new genomic locations that we didn't have before, then we'll need to impute on those regions for the other strains. So it's gonna continue to be updated over time. And one of the interesting questions is, can we can the data in Muster be used to prioritize strains for denser sequencing? Like where do we target our sequencing resources to enhance the informativeness of, of the Muster? And um, Robin's definitely looked at some of the, the um, uh, kind of errors and, and gaps in, in the imputation. And clearly where we've, we've, we've performed the worst are in some of the wild derived inbred strains um, that are currently being imported into Jackson Lab by Beth Dumont. Um, these are, these are um, strains collected by Michael Nachman around the world. And um, they're most distant from the conventional laboratory strains. She's been sequencing a number of those. So as those data come in, we expect to have improved imputation for other wild derived strains as well. And then of course we have the kind of singleton SNPs that are existing among closely related strains. And there, of course, the imputation is, is going to miss many of those. Um, but this is a great stopgap. We have hundreds of strains, really thousands. And for those that are used in phenomics, it's, it's great that we're now able to get a genome for each one of them. What if the best addiction model was an inbred strain that no one thought to sequence, but we have enough genotype information that we can kind of bring it into the fold with all the rest of the strains we're using. That in alone might motivate us to um, uh, further develop the sequence around that mouse strain. Yeah, I just wanna pile on, on that concept. So almost all of us on this call are, have been doing forward genetics for quite a while. Um, and the sequencing allows us to do reverse genetics in the same way that you'd exploit the COMPT and UCOM projects. Now you can just rummage around in the SNP database. You can select for missense, you can select for copy number variants, and then you can look it up in MDP. What, what sort of phenotypes is it an outlier for? So the outlier tool that Molly showed is powerful in combination with the SNPs. Which brings me to a suggestion for the team. So Molly, in your presentation, the very first uh, bar chart you showed was some differences in cocaine response. And you mentioned that you could pick the high and the low outliers if you wanted to do forward genetics. 
uh, it would be really interesting to be able to convolve the degree of genetic difference. So if you had two strains that were right in the middle of that bar chart, which were extremely different, you wouldn't actually have a basis for choosing those phenotypes because your presumption would be for something like cocaine locomotor activation, it would be polygenic as hell. I mean, maybe that's wrong, um, but I'm just saying that if you take the, the spread of the phenotypes as a function of the genetic spread, then you have a really good basis for selecting those strains for further analysis. Um, so it, it, that's an interesting uh, point, Rob. It, it, you, th you think about the success people have had with mapping differences that are among closely related strains and also the, the benefits of having uh, highly, highly distant strains. It might also help you decide whether your outliers are similar to one another. Are they redundant with one another or are you looking at different, different biological paths to the same endpoint? So I think, I think that's a really neat suggestion and um, perhaps one we should, we should uh, implement. You know, the, Here's the, the second the, one for you, Alyssa. Uh, so, so Alyssa and I, ha I have a long history and I can remember looking over her shoulder at her, at her portable where she would have font size that I swear was eight point font size and she was perfectly happy to read it. Uh, now, Molly, I noticed no some, true. <laughs> some, some gray, gray font in your interface. Uh, as a vision scientist, I want to tell you that contrast matters. <laughs> Do not, under any circumstances, use gray font. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. For those of us who can no longer read our phones. Um, so, so, you know, when, when, going back to outlier strains, um, you know, I think, I think one of the things that's really important is that we, we all think about genetic mapping and complex trait analysis, and we love geeking out on genetics of complex disease. But the other thing that people do is really a whole body of neurobiological research that's largely built on B6 and B6 derived kind of uh, tool strains, um, either because they have um, Cree drivers or they have um, different, um, different uh, expression indicators um, bred into them. Um, and, and what these tools allow us to do, what, the, what the, the strain selector type tools allow us to do is identify whether there are other extant inbred strains that might actually be better disease models so that we're not doing all of the neurobiology in strains that actually are kind of normal um, on, on a particular aspect of behavior. Now, I know B6 have extreme values on many alcohol-related traits, but when you look at our, our strain distribution patterns for cocaine responses and cocaine uh, self-administration, they're actually not near the outliers. They're, they're fairly midland. And uh, what, we, what we see is now, now we have the ability to engineer on some of these different backgrounds. And it's, if we can identify which backgrounds we wanna do that engineering on, we can improve the tool strains that are used in different areas of research. And we can also improve the strains that are used in preclinical testing in pharmaceutical studies. So there's, there's quite a lot of value to being able to identify, um, identify um, strains that are extreme, even if your goal is not to do a genetics project. Um, all these N of one kind of research areas, uh, you know, uh, we, we know a lot about, about a few individuals and um, B6 is one of those people. Um, you know, maybe there's another guy that we should be studying or, um, okay. So there's, there's, there's more happening in the chat. Any, any, um... Specific questions for Molly or broader questions for anybody? A lot of people on here know a lot. Rupert, I'm gonna pick on you because you're the farthest away. Any thoughts on this with the time series data that Molly showed I thought was really cool. Now, Rupert has a, a conundrum. He he's, he's plans to have whole life time series data uh, on a second by second level. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I haven't admittedly visited the MPD site for quite some time. So I have it open on another computer and 
and browsing through. Uh, extremely impressive. Um, I am just looking at a couple of toy traits in the um, in the my MPD with all the all the all the fantastic graphs and tools. I mean, I had a technical question. I I wonder how those graphs are being generated. What platform you're using? Because they're um, this is a, a fantastic resource for, for 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 browsing through in quite a, an amazing range of different comparisons. Thank you, um, Dave. Go Dave may that. answer that. I just want to say that a developer named Matt Dunn in our group and George. Um, Col uh, Col 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 Thank you, Dave. <laughs> we call him Georgie. Um, uh, developed these visualizations and and made them very very rich and interactive. Go ahead, Dave. So um, most of our visualizations are either written using D three or high charts, depending on how complex they are. Um, they're generally backed by a separate analysis server. So we have something we call the MPD analysis server that is a RESTful API with R and Python analysis code behind the scenes. Some of the things are real time, um, like correlation. Some of the things are long running, like ANOVA. Um, the meta analysis, uh, we took kind of a different uh, approach uh, and we're using a third party uh, task pipelining environment uh, to manage that. But even it still calls back like uh, for our, our GWAS, our PyLim, it calls back to our uh, MPD analysis services. Um, one of the things I, I actually think is interesting that we're kind of pushing towards is separating out our R analysis code from this um, Python REST-based service so that we could publish um, the R as packages, say, in CRAN, um, where you would be able to use them without worrying about whether or not it was MPD measures. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of a direction we're looking to go with that. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, I'm, I'm usually the type of person that likes to hook into an API and then, and then do all the, do all the work locally. But um, sometimes the, the, um, the tools of, and available in the interface are just, are just so neat for browsing. Um, I wouldn't bother. And that's, I mean, that's an interesting question because up to this point, uh, we've kept the API for the analysis services private. Uh, and that's mostly because they're dependent on MPD measures. Um, but, but if there were real interest in accessing the analysis APIs, uh, we could certainly make those public. Uh, and then I think it would be a discussion of, should we have the web-based services support anything other than MPD measures? Um, or should it go the way of what we're doing with the R where you could pass in a, a JSON bundle with your data um, mm -hmm. as an option? So that's something that we could consider in the future. Yeah, we're definitely moving in that direction, Dave, for gene network services, for example, Gemma services, basically an API call that anybody can make with a few caveats. They just have to get the, the format correct. Uh, but that's definitely how Piotr is moving the whole gene network effort uh, to uh, APIs that are potentially accessible by people like Seanock and Gary and Alyssa and Carl and others who are, you know, more geeky than I am and Laura, uh, who who just want those kinds of functions but don't want to noodle around with our GUI. Yeah. So one of the things that we're trying to work on with the the uh, repository supplement is to develop metrics and tracking for data utilization. Um, so if you submit data to MPD, we want to be able to allow you a report of how many times that data set is accessed and used in analysis um, so that you can report as progress in your work that my data set's been used so many times. Um, it's hard to go back into the literature and say, how many times has, um, I'm looking at one of our star contributors. How many times has their data set been published on by other investigators? Um, so um, there's a there's a few comments, Suzanne. Thank you for asking um, about um, pre-submission. So so not publicly available data that you might want to represent in the phenome database. Do some quality control analysis. Maybe generate some results with it um, uh, before it's actually opened up to the public. And um, uh, Molly, can you elaborate on 
uh, kind of where we are now with graded access to pre-publication data? Well, it's just pretty simple. Um, we just hold off until the investigator is happy with the way we've presented their data. But you can, uh, th that investigator can use the MPD tool suite with their data at, right after absolutely. it's submitted, but not yet made public. Absolutely. So they can use yeah. all the tools and they can correlate to MPD measures that are public uh, and no one will be able to see that result. So it's not exposed to other people's analysis. So if you've, That's if, right. you've if you've played with Gene Weaver, you'll have that similar kind of user experience of uh, being able to run all your analyses, see the data that 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 you are um, yourself in control of, but not necessarily um, have other people use your data in their work. And That's the correct. Thing I wanted to add is that that we also have the ability for you to create a group. Um, or assign other PIs. So if you have collaborators that you want to be able to share your pre-publication data with, uh, you can create a group and put people in it or just explicitly give individuals permission um, to see your data. Actually, hey, one that's, of the things that's a, that's that sounds super, um, and I'll follow up offline with you all. Um, yeah, thank you so much for answering my question. Sure, fantastic. And you know, uh, we've we've got a team of people who are um, we're not we're not sitting by the phones twenty four seven, but but um, uh, I think I think have been fairly responsive. We really do want to help people get their data into the database, and um, this includes sort of tattered old data sets that you wish you had entered ten years ago, twenty years ago. Um, <laughs> you know, it, even if it's been published, but it's not in a computable repository like this. Um, don't be shy to make those submissions. And, um, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm doing the telethon here, but uh, Robert Robbins posted that email address once again in the chat. Uh, so phenome at jacks.org, easy to remember. So, so this is a little bit of a sea change. Uh, it's probably an old sea change, but it, MDP didn't initially accept data, you know, from, it was historic, but uh, I'm going to take you up on that, Alyssa, because I have uh, 1996 uh, axon counts for about 600 different uh, individuals and about 40 strains. And it would be fun to put that in. Yeah, we want your data before you retire. And I know you're not close to retirement age, but <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean anything by it. But we, no, we really do. I mean, look, all of us have hard drives and things. And I think I've got some data under a mattress somewhere. And it's, it's much better used by the community if it's in a database. Um, so, so, um, for sure. so I didn't consider your free time. What the, what the meta analysis was the meta analysis. Was that basically in silico mapping? Was that what I was looking at? Um, you are looking at, 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 um, uh, SNP associations. Uh, so, so I would say, um, you might, you might be asking me to say yes. Um, we are trying to use the best mapping model for the data set. What we don't want to do is, you know, you could you could use a mixed model and put all the populations in one analysis, and and that actually has some problems. Um, and 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 so what we've done is the best mapping model for each population, and done a pooling of those results. So you get you get the um, and you get the PM plot, which shows um, kind of how much your individual studies are contributing to or resemble the meta-analysis result. Those are some tools that um, Elazar Eskin uh, had developed. Ah, that, that okay, cool. Yeah, Robin, the nice thing about it, sorry, Alyssa. Go ahead, Robin. I was gonna say the nice thing about it is it, it lets you pull the power right across all these different studies and all these different populations and measures and you can select the set of measures that you want to look at. Um, so let you pull that power, but then when you're looking at an individual SNP and the effect of that SNP, then you can go in, dive deep and start looking at those individual measures and studies that contributed to it. And you can um, color those points like in the PM plot and the force plot by different attributes that we've annotated to that data. Great. So that's if it's, for example, a variant that's only present in studies that used both sexes or, or um, if it's specific to treatment or, you know, right. anything like that. 
or if it's so a broader thing. One of the things we did is run the meta-analysis by vertebrate trait and MP annotation terms. So every measure annotated to each term was aggregated and rolled up to that term. And you can actually see, so say we had a term that we do lots of different assays to measure. Um, I'm gonna use the word anxiety. Um, you know, there's many different measurements that people might use and label anxiety. And you can use the meta-analysis tool to see which of those measures load onto the same SNPs. Another thing that we've done uh, in Robin's hands is multiple drugs. To, you know, if we look at self-administration, either operant or, or um, oral self-administration, um, other types of, of um, drug administration, we can do this for all the drugs that we have data for and ask whether there are shared loci that influence self-administration of multiple drugs versus distinct loci for particular drugs. And you know, this is all dependent on the extent and quality of data that come in. So this, this is something that, that gets refined as we all contribute to it. How does muster deal with F1s? Do they have to be put in explicitly or can they be sort of computed on the fly because you know both the parents and what the genome of any F1 will be? Yeah, so currently we don't have F1s in Muster, but I have done it. You know, I've used Muster to generate what I would expect the genome to be. It may yeah. not be exactly that, but it's a powerful tool to let you at least get close. If you think about it, we have the Muster, but we also have EQTL data from highly heterogeneous population. So from the imputed sequences of any strain using the EQTL from highly diverse populations, we actually can impute transcriptomes. And, and that, that means you can say, okay, for this predicted cross of two strains, what do I predict the expression level of a particular gene to be? That's cool. Or the entire transcriptome. Yeah, that'd be cool. So we have plenty of time just to come back to, um, to a topic that we have touched on. I think David actually initiated it about what assembly uh, we're working on. And Robin, you said you're going to go to MM11. And I would argue that it's not worth the effort uh, because we are now doing pangenomics of, of mice. And I know Heen is interested in doing pangenomics and there are probably people at Jack's doing pangenomics of mouse. I think we should just skip assembly reference assemblies from now on, uh, because frankly, sure. the mouse is in pretty damn good shape, except for the pseudo autosomal regions of X, uh, and we should just move on to a pan genome. Okay, I'm with you. That makes it simpler. But <laughs> but uh, yeah, so so yeah, it's it's not an easy thing to do to do it well. Um, Currently, we, you know, in, in the non-public version, we have we have like some liftover tools that you can use. So if somebody was wanting to talk to other data that's in M39, they they could MM11. Um, but we're hoping to get hope hopefully Sanger is going to release data before too long. We'll have a little bit more information on that. Yeah. And then coming is sort of related, coming back to the idea of sequencing at more strains or or doing it better. Basically, nothing should be done with Illumina now. And I know you guys have a new uh, PAC Bio SQL 2E. So just do everything hi fi and forget about Illumina. That's also old history. We're, we're happy to accept the sequence data that you generate. Okay, it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> or Thomas, Thomas has a, quite a bit of it already. Yeah. No, we've been we've been we've been pulling in and 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 working on procedures for pulling in and integrating other uh, data. And if, I know David's been working closely with us on the BXDs, um, but the the idea here is um, uh, yes, let's harmonize the data and um, provide a service that will allow everyone to use that harmonized data. I, on, I mean, that, it, on that vague topic, Rob, UM Hat three would be cool to put a, pull across into here? Um, say, say that again, David, or what was the implication to put in the UM-HET3? Yeah, the UM-HET3. 
genotypes and data. That would be an interesting API um, test case. So Alyssa, we have 13,000 UM head threes in gene network. Uh, the which, aging study. Yeah, of which about 6,800 have been genotyped, 6,300 6, really well at about 890 <laughs> markers. Um, we don't have much phenotypes, so just basically mm -hmm. three or four phenotypes, which is a little frustrating. But um, that would be good because we've really worked hard to clean up the data representation in gene network. Mm -hmm. Well, a true story is that we started doing the meta-analysis tool to resuscitate the data in the QTL archive. So, so any, any, with this imputation resource, any genome that we have genotypes for can be reconstructed. Provided, you know, if you take your 30 year old now QTL mapping studies where you did an F2 cross, as long as you know which, which zero and one represents P6 or AJ, we can impute the genomes of the mice in any F2 cross, not, not well, of course, but, you know, because of the low recombination distances. Uh, or high recombination distance. Um, but, but the point is the intent was to be able to meta-analyze genetic data from any complex population. Uh, that would include UM at three. Yeah, you, can, you can analyze that with aging DO studies, aging BXD studies, other states. So we're getting the meta-analysis, we're getting the ability to combine that information with transcriptomics and other traits measured in the same populations or different populations, because you know we used to have to be really literal. Rob and I are very literal. We were, in order to do um, systems genetics, we, we talked about ge genetic reference population had to be genetically identical mice that were fully reproducible. But by anchoring everything on a mouse genome that's fully saturated with imputed values, we can actually start relating data across disparate mouse populations without having to literally study and do genetic correlations across identical mice. Yep. I see Rupert has one more question for Robin or Alyssa about transcriptome prediction. Um, not currently public facing, Rupert, but it, it's something that, that we are actively working on in the Center for Precision Genetics at JACS and it's something that we have working enough to use. So if there's specific applications that you wanna work on with us, um, let us know. Um, Cause I think as we, as we turn that into um, a service, uh, it'd be great to have some really good use cases and people ready to actually start working with the tool. Just, yeah, just, just out of curiosity, Alyssa, are you using both SIS and TransSNPs for that prediction? Um, currently we've been primarily using SIS um, we have in the DO, we are powered in some of our studies to get transnips as well. Um, you know, we, we've got um, now several EQTL data sets where over 400 mice are um, sequenced, RNA sequenced. So we do, we do have uh, some nice EQTL data sets uh, with a large number of trans EQTLs. Yeah, this idea of... Um of, of uh, predicting F1 transcription is, is quite cool. And um, it, I mean, if, if you put that in the context of, of um, the BXD diallel F1s, mm -hmm. um, the, the idea that we could take the prediction of what each diallel cross is gonna do to a quite a significantly higher level. Um, mm -hmm. And then of course, go in and, and, and go in and test it. Um, I, I would if, be... you're, if you're just doing it at a locus level, I mean, if there's one thing that's relatively linear, it's the additive effect of sissy QTLs, except, mm -hmm. you know, if you have imprinting or something weird going on. So, you know, to me, that's just, I can do it in Excel, whip, I'm done. Um, so with the BXDs, the for sure. QTLs, it might be, make it problematic, but frankly, I don't trust the trans QTLs on any platform given the problems in the assemblies. So you'll have some crazy uh, retrotransposon that uh, is misassigned on the assembly and you've got a trans EQTL and it's not trans at all. It's actually a cis EQTL sitting in the middle of your gene. So it, it would make me a bit nervous. <laughs> 
but wouldn't wouldn't it be interesting to find to to predict some some crosses that that you would expect to behave in a certain way? Well, but test those with, think with Rob, the Rob, I think Rob is saying um, that this can be done um, easily for the BXDs because in the vast majority of cases you would predict that the F1 the heterozygous um, uh, loci are going to um, be in, in between the, the two founders. Um, for, for the collaborative cross dial so CC Rix mice or inbred DAX mice, uh, you might have different results. And, and Rob says, maybe, I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But, I, but, I've never, but, um, so, but if I ever had, if I'd ever seen a dominant mRNA uh, example or, or super dominant, I would be impressed. But in fact, I don't, I don't think there's a compelling single case of, of anything other than pure, almost pure additivity. Okay, but, but I mean, this would be a, a good way of, of um, finding those. Right, it and you'd know, where to, you'd know exactly where to look for them because they'd be in the imprinted regions. So you'd yeah. have at least 50 or 100 that you could use as a, a positive control. I think what we really want to look at um, is the sissy QTLs in the diversity outbred mice and what the allelic effects are at those loci, right? Whether there's evidence of um, a dominance deviation in those loci. And, and, then, and then we can go in and ask um, cool questions. So um, a, bit of a, a bit of a sidebar um, from the phenomics discussion. Uh, are there any, any other questions people have about mouse phenome database, the new, new tools and um, uh, applications of uh, the phenome database? Alyssa, there was one clarification I wanted to make. It looks like we've already lost a few people, but I, it's probably still worth making. Um, I don't know if it was clear that SIP the study intake platform. Our, our goal there ultimately is to make it so investigators can enter their own data. Um, uh, if you looked at that picture that Molly put up near the beginning or end with all of the staff, there were only two people on that whole thing that are curators. Um, and so really our goal to make it so we can get more data in there is to have investigators entering their own data and then relying on Molly and Gorob to really help with the cleaning and the annotation of that data. Um, so right now we, we have what we kind of refer to as a whitelist of people who can access it um, because we're kind of trying to roll it out slowly and get people's feedback as they go. So if there are people who are interested in trying to enter their own data, please reach out to us at, at phenome.jex.org um, and, and we'll set up you know, give you the access to be able to enter on studies, and then hopefully in return, get, get feedback about your experience and how we can make it easier for investigators to do it themselves. And, and my condolences in advance to anybody has to curate the community. <laughs> they're, they're, they're going to need a heavy dose of Prozac or Thorazine to, to cope with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the idea was to get as much information as we could um, uh, with the submission instead of just emailing Molly whatever you've, you've found, um, which she's done you know, for, for many years, um, uh, carefully brought in people's emailed piles of data. Um, the nice thing about the enhanced uh, study intake platform, we get a great data dictionary, really get a good definition of how the phenotypes are measured, and we get um, uh, uh, kind of some information about variable types, which informs what types of models can be applied to those data. So it's, it's, it's really helped us with um, being able to expose the data to tools in a more sophisticated way. And also, as you saw, she, what I, if anyone who's bought a, electronics in the 90s will remember these product comparison displays. And um, they, they um, uh, kindly tolerated me asking for many years for a Circuit City refrigerator comparison tool. And <laughs> happy to see that. So you can compare the studies that you're throwing into the correlative and meta-analysis tools. Yeah, I'm definitely going to play with that. Look at the Liu longevity data for what is it, almost 30 strains, and see what I can get, mm -hmm. uh, how, how it compares to the UM Head 3. Um, two quick questions, Dave, for you. 
are you using data tables for for your tables? Oh, for for the front end. Yeah. Um, but, uh, there might be a couple in there, but a lot of the tables in there predated when the data table was really robust. Um, I'm blanking on uh, the version of the table object we're using, but maybe this is a good time to say um, the study intake platform is implemented in Angular. Uh, so we've taken the build a UI that's a separate client from our backend and our backend for the study intake platform is a RESTful API. Uh, so we're in the process of redesigning the MPD front end uh, and we'll be re-implementing that in Angular. So, so they won't be data tables. Um, once that re-implementation happens, they will be, I can't remember right now, but whatever the standard widget is for, for tables um, in Angular. Uh, and then MPD will become a RESTful backend. Uh, and actually, as a further step, we're going to kind of trim down what, what is the MPD backend and rely heavily on just using the API um, from the study intake platform. Because today, they really are two separate apps with a complete API and a complete database between each. And we have a, re a release process when data becomes public where we move data to staging and then 24 hours later we move it to public and really my preference is just to maintain kind of a single mpd app which is the equivalent of that preview that molly showed so when you have private data in study intake you can click a preview button and you can see your data in mpd but it's really just this preview instance and so my goal is just to replace the whole thing with a single app that has the ability to use it as a a public user and you can just see public data or you can log in and you can see your private data without having to go to another instance. That'd be great. Yeah. My, I, I didn't see Molly, whether you had a, an outlier detection algorithm, uh, a transformation option step for the user during data entry. If their data is, is highly skewed, do, can you, is there a button that says just log normalize it, please? No, we don't have that. We've talked about it over the years and just have not done that. Robin, do you want to chime in? And yeah, know, so I, I, think, I think the sorry. data that goes into that has been normalized. And so you, if you wanted to upload your data, you would probably have to do that ahead of time. Okay. But basically, so converting to a z-score for the strain. Yeah. So, so it's a you know for certain tools, normalization or standardizations are built into a pre-processing step. So you'd have to look at each tool's documentation. So a user doesn't have to stop what they're doing and transform their data for input into those tools, right? The user selections are prepared for the model assumptions of the tool that they're running. Ah, uh, yeah. No, that's a good idea. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we're sort of struggling with this idea. How, uh, you know, the, the blatant outliers, uh, you, you want to put them in there because obviously they're going to be important if you've got a mutation that you think generates the outlier. But on the other hand, if you're doing the mapping, it'll totally mess it up. So, yeah, I like that kind of more dynamic approach to doing it. Yeah. Okay. Well, and it's nice because you can look across, you know, this is a multivariate analysis. And so you can, you can look across lots of measures for these strains and find strains that are extreme. Yep. Yeah. So this is so so just just to clarify the conversation, um, Robin's talking about the multivariate outlier detection tool where we find strains that are multivariate outliers. Rob, you're talking about in any instance where we're using trait data, uh, and it, there is a particular strain that's an extreme outlier. Um, you know, how is that dealt with in the ANOVA modeling versus the outlier detection tool versus other tools that have statistical assumptions underlying um, the estimation that's being performed, such as exactly. a normal, just exactly. a, a typical correlation coefficient. How is that being calculated when there are outliers present in the data? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So where are you as a team going in terms of Structural equation modeling, Bayesian network mapping, more sophisticated modeling that nobody who's a, a real biologist can wrap their heads around, but the real statisticians think it's baby talk. Uh, I'm just at the baby talk stage. <laughs> well, you know, I think like Jan Swee's built a nice service for Bayesian network. And as long as we 
kind of move into a more modular framework, we don't need to write every single one of these services. What we need to do is prioritize the um, wrapping and integration of those services. So it may be that you leave MPD with a package that's ready to go into another service. And so those are the types of things that we really wanna focus on in our data integration discussions is really how do we standardize the process of, of passing data out from, from one of these um, repositories into uh, multiple services, whether they are part of the MPD suite proper or possibly someone else's tool suite. Cool. 